We race because it's who we are. We race to compete. On the tracks, in the pits, as a sport. But we all race for something bigger. It's time we race for equality. It's time we race for sustainability. It's time we race to be global citizens. It's time we race for equal access, opportunities, and representation. In January of 2017, Formula One was officially acquired by American mass media company, Liberty Media. Five years on from that initial purchase, Formula One has experienced a boom unlike any other sports league. With an extremely successful Netflix series, a young core of marketable drivers, and the addition of two new racetracks in Las Vegas and Miami, the sport has grown exponentially in a relatively short amount of time. However, that growth has not necessarily arrived in all aspects of the proverbial peak of motorsport. Concerns about human rights, environmental impact, and fan behavior have muddied the waters of F1's ascent into mainstream popularity. We've talked a lot, in fact, on most of the questions that we've dealt with about energy and the need well, for renewable energies. It, and here you are, you're a Formula One driver, yeah, which is one of the most gas-guzzling sports in true. the world. Yeah, it's true. And it's, does that make you a hypocrite? It does. It does. And you're right. You know, you're right when you laugh, because, I mean, there's questions I ask myself. It's in these muddied waters that the organization faces down one of its largest challenges yet. In June of 2020, Formula One launched the We Races One initiative, quote, aimed at tackling the biggest issues facing the sport and global communities, the fight against COVID-19, and the condemnation of racism and inequality. With seven-time world champion Lewis Hamilton and four-time world champion Sebastian Vettel being two of the most outspoken drivers in the areas of sustainability and social justice, this initiative was the first step in answering criticism for Formula One's supposed silence during the racial renaissance triggered by the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. But now, two years on from the launching of this campaign, questions still remain on its effectiveness and real-world application to the Formula One community. On July 15, 2022, Aiden Luo, a carbon fiber tech and contractor for the Aston Martin Cognizant F1 team, came forward with allegations of workplace harassment and racism. Before even walking into my work environment, that's when I was told, look, if you've got a problem with how we speak here, it's just how we speak. First nickname, Brownie, which is, that's when it started. How often would the N-word have been used? Hourly, hourly, within, like, yeah, that, that's how, I wasn't referred to as AD or anything like that, no. I was called and Brownie, that's what I was referred to. In the piece by Sky Sports, Luo, a dual citizen of South Africa in the UK with mixed heritage, was reported to have been called the N-word and subjected to apartheid jokes. On July 21st, 2022, Formula 2 driver and Red Bull Racing signee Yuri Vips was indefinitely suspended and eventually released from the team after being recorded on a Twitch live stream using a racial slur. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yuri. Yeah, yeah. He was removed from his duties as a reserve and test driver for the main Red Bull Formula 1 team, but was retained by their junior driver program despite the evidence. He now races in Formula 2 with high tech GP despite wide criticism for their retention of his contract. Now, this all might seem like a lot, especially when looking through the lens of the We Races One initiative. But to learn more about the Formula One community, I had to go to the people who knew it best. I sat down with Formula One writer and TV presenter Lawrence Barreto, as well as former racing driver and TV presenter Karun Chantok, to talk about their journeys into Formula One media and how diversity has impacted the pinnacle of motorsport. Um, so I'm Lawrence Barreto. I'm a, a presenter and writer at FormulaOne.com, and I do some work for Channel 4 as a, a, a reporter. Uh, and I have what I describe as the best job of the world. I get to interview the drivers um, across the weekend. When I was younger, I watched a lot of Formula One with my dad. Um, we watched a lot of sport, but Formula One was what really got me excited. Like I, I was a big fan of James Bond when I was younger and I thought that was a cool job. And, and you know, I thought this was pretty close as you know, being a journalist covering, covering Formula One around the world. Hi, my name's Tarun Chando. I'm a former Formula One driver, but also raced in Formula E and at Le Mans and uh, all sorts of other categories along the way. I spend most of my time as one of the commentator presenters for Sky Sports F1 in the UK. One of the other things I do is a, a TV show on Discovery Channel called Fifth Gear, which is uh, all about cars, as you can imagine. You know, ever since I was a kid, my, my only dream and objective was to race in Formula One and to be in, be in Formula One. You know, obviously growing up in a country like India, that's a bit more challenging. You're, you know, 6,000 miles away from the epicenter of the sport here in the UK. The first Indian to get to Formula One was in 2005, and by then I was already, you know, in Formula Three. So, uh, and even now, we've only had two two Indians in F1 out of 1.3 billion people. It's been a bit of an adventure, but yeah, I, I never really thought of doing anything else, really. 
for the vast majority of the time that I've been in Formula One, not a lot has changed. I think it's been the same voices, it's been the same personalities, it's been limited to a, a smaller group of, of people. Um, and it's only maybe in the last one, two, three, four years that I've noticed some realistic change from in the media, there's a greater diversity now. There's people from more different backgrounds. There's always different nationalities because you Formula One's loved across the world, but there's definitely a greater diversity from backgrounds where perhaps they didn't have the same opportunities. Um, also good, better on the gender side of things as well. There's more women involved in the media side of things, both print and broadcasting. It's been slower, if I'm honest, on the, the team personnel side. On the diversity side, you're not really seeing, at least in those top level positions, that kind of mix of, of personalities and cultures. You're just not seeing that at the minute. And at Sky, we were, you know, we were doing a, a whole bunch of things at, uh, around Black History Month. And we went to all the teams and said, you know, I'd like to speak to black members of your team to uh, just get a, get a sense from them of, you know, when I when I ask them to think about Black History Month, what does it mean to them? What do they think about what comes to mind? How do they feel working in Formula One? And I mean, it, it was quite something as we were desperately trying to find half a dozen people in, in the paddock because they weren't. It's obviously from the driving perspective, apart from Lewis, he's been carrying kind of the weight of it on his shoulders um, since the time he got into Formula One uh, around 2007. I think it was just super important that Formula One and all the teams and the FIA did something. I think it was important that we started the conversation more broadly, uh, more publicly. I think Lewis Hamilton has spoken out many times about it, but I think it needed a wider number of people to get involved and really create a swell. It's not about not being racist, it's about being anti-racist. It's about telling people that change has to happen, that it's an unacceptable view to have these prejudices. I was lucky. I never felt like I was treated differently because of the color of my skin. Um, I felt like teams, other drivers, they treated me the same. They treated me for my merits as a as a driver or my demerits, whatever my weaknesses were. And similarly, when I went to the broadcasting world, I, I never ever felt like I was treated differently. But I think where unquestionably you see differences is in the wider world. You know, for example, when it comes to traveling. We'll get to the security gate and my bag will be the only one that gets checked. People do a double take, but you know, there'll be a 35 of us get off a bus to go to the track. Even nowadays, it's a bit funny how the security people look at your passes. It's just a bit different to go, hang on a second. Are you sure you're like, are you meant to be with this lot? What's happening here? Are you trying to sneak in? But that's not a Formula One thing, right? That is a societal issue with those people are on the, what I call the periphery of the sport. If you really want to make effective change and not just put lipstick on a pig, then you need to think 10 years. So when people say to me, okay, we brought, you know, we launched We Races 1 and all this is, there's all this noise around it in 2020. What's happened? I walk around the paddock and I don't see any more non-white people around. It's like, uh, anyone who asks the question is just dreaming. You know, they just haven't understood the concept of, of how a structured program needs to work. I, I do want to say though that I don't I don't think Formula One has a racism problem. I, I've come through Formula One and I've I've not encountered people, but I do think there is something within some people's subconscious that they automatically make assumptions um, with people who are who aren't white, and I think they just they do things like you might get extra bag searches at security. So there are little things like that that I think are unfortunate. But I think that things are starting to change. And I think that's the most important thing. People are trying to use their voice. People are speaking out about it. We're doing this chat right now. And I think, I just think it's important.